Hey everybody. Today we're talking about inverse functions. Remember, a function is just a rule that sends every input value to exactly one output value. Sometimes we're able to send those values back. And in that situation, we call the rule that sends the values back the inverse function, f inverse of x. Um, it's denoted f with a superscript negative 1. That's not an exponent, so this is different than 1 over f of x. It's just notation that means the inverse function. Here's a slightly more formal definition. y equals f of x just means x equals f inverse of y. Here's an example, a function defined by a table of values. So f sends 0 to 3, 1 to 5, and so on. The inverse function, f inverse, is going to send the values back. So it sends 3 to 0, 5 to 1, and so on. We can read inverse values off of graphs using that knowledge. So for example, here's a plot of a function that passes through 3 comma 2, meaning that f of 3 is equal to 2. Using the definition of an inverse function, this means that f inverse of 2 must be 3 just swapping the input and output values. And therefore, the graph of y equals f inverse of x has to pass through 2 comma 3. Always remember, inverse functions swap the inputs and outputs, the x and y values of the original function. Using that knowledge, we can construct graphs of inverse functions fairly easily. Whenever we have a point a comma b on the graph of y equals f of x, we have a point b comma a on the graph of y equals f inverse of x. For example, here's the graph of a function that passes through 2 comma 1. The inverse function is going to pass through 1 comma 2. Additionally, this graph passes through 4 comma 4. Swapping those inputs and outputs, the graph of f inverse has to also pass through 4 comma 4. Plotting a few more points, connecting the dots in a smooth way, we get a graph like this for y equals f inverse of x. The net effect, by the way, is a reflection across the line y equals x. Let's talk about domain and range for a minute. Remember, the domain of a function is the set of all allowed input values, and the range is the set of all possible output values from that function. A lot of times, we'll draw an arrow diagram like this, and envision f sending values from the domain literally by that arrow to the range of f. When we have an inverse function, the arrow just gets reversed. The inverse function is literally sending those values back. So the domain of f of x is the range of f inverse of x. And the range of f is the domain of f inverse. For shorthand, we can just say that the domain and the range are exactly reversed. Perhaps your main intuition um, for inverse functions should be this. Inverse functions undo the original function. Slightly more formally, f inverse of f of x is x for all x in the domain of f, and f of f inverse of x is going to be x for all x in the range of f, which is, by the way, the domain of f inverse. So, for example, here's a function 1 over x minus 2, and it's inverse 2 plus 1 over x. And here, I'm just telling you that these functions are inverses. Um, we can kind of verify that by doing f inverse of f of x. So plugging 1 over x minus 2 into f inverse. In that case, we get 2 plus 1 over 1 over x minus 2, which is 2 plus x minus 2, which is x. Um, notice that the domain of y equals f of x is all real numbers except for 2. And therefore, we're able to conclude that the range of f inverse is all real numbers except 2. Not all functions have inverses, unfortunately. Here's another function defined just by a table of values, sending 1 to 3, 2 to 5, and so on. Now, an inverse function would have to flip that table, like this, sending 3 to 1, 5 to 2, and so on. Unfortunately, there's a problem here. Can you see what it is? According to this table, the value 3 is being mapped to both 1, there in the first column, and to 4, there in the fourth column. So the thing that I've labeled f inverse of x is actually not a function at all. We certainly shouldn't call it an inverse function. 
we'd like to have a general rule that lets us know in advance when a function has an inverse. So let's look back at this last example and identify specifically what the problem was. The thing that came up that caused the problem was that some output values were repeated in our original function. And therefore, when we flipped the inputs and outputs, we got to a situation where an input value was repeated and had two different outputs. Remember, a function is a rule that signs each input to exactly one output. So we can't have multiple outputs for the same input. So for an inverse function to exist, we can't have um, multiple inputs with the same output. The phrase for a function like that is one to one. That's a function that does not repeat output values. Here's a slightly more technical definition. This is the one that gets used in slightly more advanced math. If f of x1 is equal to f of x2, then x1 is equal to x2. Or in words, if two functions have the same output, then it must actually be the same value that we're plugging in. Just as we can tell if a graph represents a function by using the vertical line test, we can tell if a function has an inverse using the horizontal line test. Here's how it works. Here's a graph of a function, y equals f of x. We can tell it's a function by imagining a vertical line going left to right. If that vertical line never touches the graph at more than one point at a time, then we have a function. Similarly, the horizontal line test asks, asks us to imagine a horizontal line moving from bottom to top on this grid. If it ever touches the graph more than once, the graph is representing a function that is not one to one. If it always touches the graph at one point at a time at most, then we do have a function that is one to one and therefore we'll have an inverse. In this case, in the example that I've drawn, we can draw many different horizontal lines that impact the graph in more than one point at a time, like the one I've drawn here. This is not a one-to-one -one function. It does not have an inverse. On the other hand, this graph is one-to-one. -one. It does have an inverse. Any horizontal line that we could draw only touches the graph at at most one point. We can check algebraically whether a function f is one-to-one -one just by applying this slightly more formal definition that I mentioned. f of x1 equals f of x2 implies x1 equals x2. So basically, I'm going to plug x1 and x2 into my function and then try and do some algebra to get to a place where I've shown that x1 equals x2. Let's do an example to illustrate that. Here's a function, f of x equals negative 2x plus 9. Is it invertible? That is, is it 1 to 1? So I'm going to do exactly what I said I would do. I'm going to set f of x1 equals f of x2, plug x1 and x2 into the function, and then simplify. I'm going to subtract off the 9s, and then divide both sides by negative 2. So I've shown that if, x, if f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 must equal x2, therefore the function is 1 to 1, and therefore it has an inverse.